This is the KE Arms uh, quick takedown model. I believe that's the, called the collapsible stock. All right, let's go. All right guys, so today we're going to be talking about the breakage issue that me and Alex have had with our KP-15 lowers. This is the state mine is currently in, and we're going to talk about how exactly it got to this state. So Alex, why don't you start by talking on the background of our so, lowers. So, I got my KP-15 in December of 2021 into January of 2022. I had mine crack in January of 2023, and um, that was about one year ago today. I only had a crack in the lower receiver. I got it shipped back to KE Arms, and they shipped me back a new one, and I haven't had any issues since then. Yeah, so I first got my KP-15 lower in uh, August 2022, and I eventually met Alex about three months ago, and that's around the time that I started running my rifle a lot more seriously. It used to be kind of a range queen, then I started taking it out and actually using it. If I was crawling, it was in the dirt with me. Um, I wasn't overly harsh on it, um, but I treated it you know, like any other rifle. Mm -hmm. um, Typical wear and tear on the system. Right, and when Alex told me, when I initially met him about his lower cracking, I almost couldn't believe it because I had seen, for example, the recoil TV videos where they did a torture test on the lower and they were straight up butt stroking it onto a six by six piece of lumber with no issues, it seemed. Uh, so that's what sold me on the reliability of the lower originally. So I couldn't believe it when Alex told me about the crack in his until about a month later, mine cracked as well. So Alex, talk about the use case that we had and <clears throat> what the condition was so, when I broke. So again, it was January of 2023. I was out doing a drill. There was some shooting involved. I was doing some IMT drills. Um, everything went as normal. Went back to my car, left my rifle in my car for five days. Then my friend came over, pulled the gun out of my car, and all of a sudden there was a crack there. It happened while I was doing the IMTs, or while I was in the car. I don't know when it happened, but it happened sometime from the beginning of that drill to the time I got pulled out of my car. Right, and similar thing for me, I was on a FTX. Uh, rifle got treated as normal, no excessive abuse, except I put it in my car when I was done with the FTX, and it stayed there for four or five days during the winter when it was probably uh, between 30 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I took it out of the car, didn't notice a crack, but I wasn't looking to be fair. I brought it inside into the 69, 70 degree uh, air. And then about a week later, I picked it up out of my safe and noticed the crack in the same exact spot that I had seen his crack in uh, about a month earlier. Same size and same length and same spot. Exactly. Um, now, we do know that there has been some issues with polymer and firearms, even going back to the 1940s when the Germans were having cracking issues with their MG34 grips, uh, which were made of Bakelite, which given that's a more primitive uh, polymer material, but they eventually came out with a all aluminum winter grip. Um, we're kind of seeing a similar thing where these polymer lowers are having a lot of issues in the cold weather. Um, now, I watched Forgot we both watched Forgotten Weapons video talking about the original Colt uh, polymer AR-15 lowers and how they were cracking in the exact same spot that me and Alex had our lowers crack in. There's also a video of Russell Fagan, Sinister Rifleman, who helped develop the KP-15 lower, talking about how there was some de debate between them and the mold flow engineers for the injection molding process, um, where the KP-15 designers wanted to have more material in the area that me and Alex uh, had that cracking issue, whereas the mold flow engineers argued that they should have less. 
-hmm. And there's things like, uh, for example, the plastics guys were recommending like, well, you should leave more uh, material out of where the selector is, like below there, mm -hmm. so that it cools faster. Because that was a the, like one of the final points to actually cool in the mold flow analysis. Like, mm -hmm. you can't change those dimensions in inside there underneath the selector, or you're potentially introducing. Um, problems with the way the fire control group is going to operate or more room for debris uh, to collect beneath the fire control group. So, And that makes sense when you look at this. That's actually the, a lot of polymer density right there right under the selector. For At any rate, uh, the primary point of weakness that you have to worry about on an AR-15 lower is going to be right here, basically at the base of the buffer tube tower. However, it leaves some serious weak points uh, in the receiver. And the hole here for the safety selector is, is a big one. Um, there is a very thin wall down here in the safety selector, and that would turn out to be a fairly fragile area on the CAV-15. But me personally looking at it, it seems like there's a pretty substantial amount of material in that area, and it's pretty surprising that it did break. Mm -hmm. Especially since if you watch their video on making the KP-15 lowers, that spot where the takedown pin is, where that crack is forming, is not molded into the receiver. That's actually milled out from what I can tell after Close. the fact. Yep. Um, so that's even more surprising. And also to note on the website, there's a Cerakote warning. So it could be that with the temperatures involved in Cerakoting, that can do the lower, do yeah. something to the lower. Um, Sinister Reckman in one of his videos in the Q&A said that if you're going to Cerakote your what would Sooner do rifle or your KP-15, there's a special process in doing that, that it's not as hot, and again, it's temperature related as to not messing up your rifle and stuff like that. And I think it even breaks the warranty if you circle your rifle without following their guidelines and stuff like that. So again, this is where I think all of this is temperature related. Again, we're not scientists, and we haven't done extensive studies on what's going on, but from personal experience and putting two together, it, it seems like this is a temperature issue that's causing these, uh, these problems. Right. And I'm coming from an engineering background. I have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. I worked as a product design engineer, manufacturing engineer. Uh, now I'm a mechanical engineer. And from what I can tell through looking uh, at all of my uh, old material on injection molding and doing a lot of research, I don't think that there was anything necessarily wrong with the process that they went through for injection molding the part. I think it is just the issue with polymers in cold weather. Now there is additives that they can add uh, to the polymer mixture uh, that can help in cold weather, but like anything, it's going to be a give and take. Uh, so it might lose one of the other attributes of it, of uh, the lower. Um, so these were by no means uh, safe queens for the most part, at least for the first part of their lives. Um, we weren't going out of our way to uh, break these. We're not trying way. to give K arms bad name. We're not trying to, to bash on anybody. This was just normal wear and tear that I think was very realistic to any other soldier in a combat setting. Again, what would Stunner do? I feel like the whole point of this project was to design a rifle for the infantryman, the infantryman in mind, not the civilian. So Right, and we'll roll in some footage of like standard use examples of wear and tear of our wear and tear on our rifles. Um, and we've never modified them in any way. Never they removed are, material. The yeah. only thing is we've spray painted them. That's yeah. pretty much it. They, we spray painted them. Other than that, they are exactly how they came from the factory. Um, so some final conclusions. Uh, what have you liked about the KP-15? I like the flared Magwell personally. I thought there'd be concerns with dirt and stuff getting inside of there, but I've had no issues yet. Um, with cold weather, with very big thick gloves, it makes it very easy insert a magazine and uh, under high stress or under high fatigue it makes it a lot easier to reload. Right. Um, I agree with what he said. I thought the grip angle was fine. I like the length of pull of the stock. I like the location of the QD points. Um, overall I absolutely loved this lower until I had that cracking issue. Um, what would you like to see? So personally I think it's a little ridiculous with the takedown pins. I understand that there's engineering um, flaws that they can't have the pins be retained into the receiver. However, just like with the G3 platform, there are holes in the buttstock to retain the pins. Because again, what would Eugene Stunner do? Supplying an infantryman with a rifle, this is going to some 
random private who doesn't give a shit, he's going to lose his stuff, and if you lose your retaining pins, your weapon becomes inoperable. So I think if they could figure out a way to put holes into the, the buttstock to retain the takedown pins, I think that'd be very beneficial. I also think that the KP-15 should come stock with the trapdoor. I don't think you should have to buy it. That's just personal opinion. I think it's a little ridiculous that they don't come stock, but again, my personal opinion. Right. As far as my opinion goes, uh, I've noticed that all of the testing, all of the reviews, uh, the manufacture of these rifles all happen in very warm climates like in Arizona or the western United States. Uh, we live uh, in the more northeastern part of the United States where our winters are typically in the 20 to 30 degree Fahrenheit range. Um, so if you live in that climate, maybe you should reconsider. Or maybe eventually KE Arms will come out with a cold weather version of their rifle. Um, like I said, there's additives you can put into polymer to make it more resilient to the cold. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't, I find, I would, I would find it very hard to believe if no one else living in cold conditions has, hasn't run into this issue. Hasn't because run into this issue. Two different dudes have only met uh, each other recently. Both got paid KP-15s at different times from different batches yet use them in the same conditions and have the same results. What does that tell you about the product? Right. So, again, personally, if you're using for this as a range toy, go ahead, by all by means. Great option, great toy, great idea. Using this for a very serious context where your life depends on it, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, I can, I personally, as a engineer, I understand that things are developed for certain use cases. I believe that if this is a known issue, they should at least have it on their website that these are prone to cracking under cold conditions. Um, but yes, if you live in a if you live in a hot climate where it very rarely gets under let's say 50 degrees Fahrenheit, I don't think you have much to worry about, but again, it's up to you whether you want to buy it or not. Um, I'll show some photos of a weight comparison between this lower and a standard uh, aluminum AR-15 complete lower. It's about a half pound difference, where the aluminum lower being a half pound heavier. Is that half pound worth your life? I mean, the aluminum lower has been around since the AR-15 was designed. It's been battle proven. Why change that out to save half a pound? That's just what I'm saying. I, I think the idea is great. I, I believe that your rifle should be as light as possible. But if it's going to fail on you to the point where your weapon becomes inoperable, I, I think that does, there's no justification for that. And it is worth noting that the rifle did crack originally, and I had used it for a few FTXs since then, and it worked all right. If you did twist the buttstock a little bit, it would enlarge the crack a little, so I was very careful to not do that, not put any undue stress on it. Um, in the meantime, I have the shipping label from KE Arms to send it back, but just today, uh, we were outside, I kind of tripped on my rifle, as you'll see, and it broke in half. Yeah. Um, so now it's completely inoperable, whereas with the crack, it was operable, but you probably wouldn't want to run it like that, as we see here. We're not out here to bash anybody or to uh, defame anybody. This is just personal experience that I think should be shared on the internet, because I don't really see a lot of people talking about this or really the KP-15 being used in this context. Um, a lot of it is just these um, reviewers or hobbyists that review the KP-15 right out of the box. They might shoot a couple hundred rounds, but I haven't really seen any videos of people using it in the field, in realistic situations where they're pounding on it, they're moving with it, they're sleeping with it for days on end. That's all I pretty much have to say is, uh, is that. Yeah. Overall, I think that other than that issue with the climate and with the temperature, I think the lower is pretty nice, honestly, but that is a very big issue, and it's just one of those, maybe they did consider it during the development process, or maybe it was overlooked. We don't know. Um, but, but until these issues get resolved, I can't recommend it, I can't recommend it personally, for a serious context. Um, right up there, you think that's good? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to thank my patrons for uh, supporting this content. This video was filmed on a Canon TAI Rebel. Uh, thanks to my patrons, I'm able to afford things like this to produce better content quality. Uh, I got a Patreon subscriber right here in front of me, so thank this guy. Uh, he put some money into this camera as well. 
Um, thank you for the support and let me know your thoughts down below.